Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Or if this is your first time here, then just welcome. This is Cruel Intentions, a true crime channel. I am Holly, and I cover true crime cases throughout Australian history. And this is episode two. Woo! So strap yourselves in, because this one is a bit of a wild ride. Today I'm going to be talking about the case of Archie Mad Dog McCafferty and the Kill 7 Murders. Now, Archie is sometimes referred to as Australia's Charles Manson. Personally, I think the link is a little bit of a reach. I mean, he did rope in a bunch of people to help him, and he did hear voices telling him to do it, but I still think it's a bit far off Manson. But have a listen and tell me what you think in the comments. So Archibald Beattie McCafferty was born in Glasgow, Scotland in 1948. His family were living in a bleak, poverty-stricken, working-class neighbourhood. You can imagine things like having to ration food and resorting to torn-off strips of the newspaper instead of being able to afford necessities like toilet paper. Now his parents were Archie Senior and Clementine McCafferty, and it's reported that his father was not only verbally abusive, but very physically abusive towards his children. He would regularly beat Archie Jr. with a fireman's belt, which had a huge silver buckle on it. And if little Archie was being a nuisance, he'd lock him in the coal bin, which is basically like a big steel bucket that you would keep coal in for the fireplace. Now, this constant abuse caused Archie Jr. to start acting out at a really young age. He said in an interview later in life that he would take his dog for a walk and he would train his dog to jump on and pin down little girls so that he could cut off their hair. He would cut off their pigtails or their ponytails and he would run back home and put them into a box that he kept in his bedroom. Now, when Archie Jr. was 10, his parents decided to migrate to Australia to escape the dreary post-World War II harsh lifestyle they were living but also to try to curb Archie's unruly behaviour. Now, by the way, I'm probably not going to continue calling him Archie Jr. I'm just going to stick with Archie for now because I probably won't be discussing his father much more. Now, the family, including Archie and his brother, first moved to Melbourne and then shortly after that settled in Bass Hill, which is in the west of Sydney. Archie's behaviour, though, did not improve. He was caught stealing, breaking and entering, picked up for larceny and a number of other petty crimes. By the age of 12, he was entered into an institution for wayward boys. And for the next six years, Archie would move between five different institutions, including the notorious Tamworth Institution for Boys. The Tamworth home had a reputation for accommodating the young men that couldn't behave or ran away from the other homes for boys. Another five of that institution's residents would actually go on to become some of Australia's worst killers and criminals. These included James Smith, an arsonist who killed 15 people in a firebombing in Brisbane, Kevin Crump, whose adult prisoner file is stamped never to be released for the murder of two people, and William Monday, who grew up to become a convicted rapist and also killed another prison inmate. Some of the treatment at the institution included starvation, sleep deprivation, stress positioning, regular beatings, being made to wear a cardboard box on their head for entire days at a time, and manual labour. And not manual labour to accomplish anything or to build anything. It was just literally forcing the boys to push around up to 14 kilograms worth of sandstone blocks until they were so weak they couldn't move. Dr. Michael DeFern, the chair of the Australian Psychology Association's College of Forensic Psychologists, said in an interview that the Tamworth Institute for Boys is more than likely to have intensified any violent tendencies that the boys had before they even got there. It was reported that whilst Archie was in these institutions, he developed a liking for animal torture. He once said to a psychiatrist that he liked to strangle dogs, cats and chickens just to see what it was like. He would also take them to the roof and throw these animals off. He would sprint down the stairs to see if he could see them hit the ground, or at least what had happened to them when they did. By the time Archie was 18 years old, he was listed as an incorrigible juvenile delinquent, and one detective had even described him as the toughest kid he'd ever met. Now, Archie continued to commit small crimes and would spend many short terms in prison. 
By the age of 24, he'd been in and out of the prison system and had racked up a total of over 35 convictions, from breaking and entering, grand theft auto, vagrancy, receiving stolen goods, to larceny and assault. Now, these assaults generally always came from being in fistfights with police upon being caught, and none of his other crimes had involved any violence or assault, so he was never listed as a violent criminal. He was, though, overly obsessed with violent films, his absolute favourites being A Clockwork Orange and The Godfather, and he watched both of these movies many, many times over. Now, to top that all off, he was regularly abusing drugs like PCP and LSD, as well as drinking heavily. It was at this age, 24, in 1972, that Archie met Janice Reddington. She was working at a hotel as a switchboard operator, and he frequented that hotel to drink. He fell in love with Janice, and the two were quickly married. Now, it was only six weeks after they'd said I do that Janice came home to find Archie in bed with another woman. Now, although this incident angered Janice, Archie was the one to react aggressively. He got angry, and he mercilessly beat his own wife for catching him being unfaithful. Now, Archie knew that this behaviour wasn't acceptable. I mean, he must have, because he requested to be admitted into the local psychiatric hospital. But Archie wouldn't stay there very long. He discharged himself after a very short time and decided that he didn't need his medication. He threw away his sedatives and started drinking again and continued to violently abuse his wife. Janice, in the meantime, had found out that she was pregnant, but this wouldn't save her from the violence that Archie had a habit of dealing out. He would get drunk most nights and would beat her repeatedly. He would even strangle her until she almost passed out, only letting go right before she'd fall unconscious. One night, when he'd beaten Janice so badly that he'd almost killed her and the baby, he decided that he'd book himself back into the hospital. He told psychiatrists that he'd been thinking about killing his wife and her family, and he wanted to get rid of the evil thoughts that were in his head, and that's why he'd checked himself in. But after only a few days, he went right on ahead and checked himself back out again. Because he'd voluntarily admitted himself, there was nothing that the doctors could do to stop him discharging himself. As soon as Archie had left the hospital, he went right back to the bottle and the drugs. His drug abuse got worse, and so did his drinking. He ended up getting a job with the waste department on a rubbish truck doing pickups, and this seemed to calm him and soothe him and keep him busy during the day, but at night, his violence seemed to be getting worse. Now, on the 4th of February, 1973, Janice gave birth to their son, Craig Archibald McCafferty. Archie's mother, Clementine, said that the birth of his son changed Archie. It made him softer, it turned him into a different person, it made him calmer. Janice, however, strongly disagreed with that assessment. He was still drinking, he was still taking all sorts of drugs, and he was still beating her. She even said that she was so scared of taking the baby in the car if Archie was driving, for fear that he'd have an accident and kill them all. But Craig, tragically, would only live for six short weeks. In the early hours of the morning on the 17th of March, Janice was feeding Craig, when she decided that she'd take the baby to bed with her. She'd fallen asleep and had woken back up at 9am. She found that the little boy was unresponsive. Janice had fallen asleep and rolled over onto her child. He hadn't survived. Now, in the late 90s, the statistics were that three out of every 28 unexpected infant deaths were caused by accidental asphyxia with breastfed co-sleeping. Unexpected infant deaths also include things like SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. It is very rare for that to happen, but it does happen. Janice was completely exonerated of any crime. It was an accident. She felt like the only good thing in her life had been taken from her, and she would never completely recover from this incident. It was stated by the coroner at the inquest into the child's death months later that he could not find anything critical of her for what had happened. Archie McCafferty, on the other hand, could. He hated Janice for what he said she'd done on purpose to hurt him. 
a week after Craig's death, he had come after Janice with a fence picket, intending to kill her. Her brothers had stepped in and taken to Archie themselves with their fists. Now, I would imagine that they were also taking out some aggression on Archie for what he'd been doing to their sister for the last year. The next day, Archie appeared at his mother's house in Bass Hill, and upon seeing her son in this state, Clementine convinced him to again check himself into the psychiatric hospital. It would be Archie's third self-admission in nine months. Now, while in the Parramatta Psychiatric Centre, Archie met a woman named Carol Ellen Howes. Carol had separated from her husband and he had kept custody of their three children. In the last two years, Carol had attempted to commit suicide three separate times. Now, while they were in the hospital, she told Archie that she had planned to try it again, and he had talked her out of it. That had formed a really close bond between the two, and they decided that they needed to look out for each other. So when Archie discharged himself again, they moved into a flat together in the suburb of Earlwood. The two had also made friends with a 16-year-old girl named Julie Todd, who was in the ward being treated for her various mental illnesses. When she told them that she had nowhere to go after being released, they immediately took her in as well. Over the next couple of months, Archie frequented a tattooist in Blacktown. Archie McCafferty was covered almost head to toe in tattoos. He'd been getting them ever since he was in and out of prison. It was his passion. Now, some of them were crudely drawn with sewing needles and Indian ink to pass the time while he was locked up, but most of these ones had been covered professionally on the rare occasions that he hadn't been incarcerated. He had saved a large spot on his chest for something special, and as soon as he discharged himself from the hospital, he had gone to get a memorial tattoo for his son. It was a tombstone in the shape of a cross, embedded in a blood-red rose, inscribed with in memory of Craig. He'd also gone back to have more work done. This time he wanted to have his favourite number tattooed, the number seven. He got this done in the webbing of his thumb and forefinger as he lacked almost any other clear bit of skin apart from his face. Now seven was Archie's lucky number. He did everything in sevens. He said in an interview that if he combed his hair, he combed it seven times. If he was itchy, he'd scratch seven times. He would count to seven after striking a match before he lit up a smoke. And he decided at this point that to avenge his son's death, seven people needed to die. It was at this tattoo shop that Archie had met and befriended a few teenagers that would eventually help form his gang or family if we're still drawing reference to Manson. Michael John Meredith, known as Mick, Richard William Whittington, known as Dick, and get this, I kid you not, Donald Richard Webster, known as Rick. Now they were all 17 years old, but so we have Archie, Carol, Julie, Mick, Dick, and Rick. Like you honestly just couldn't make this stuff up. Mick, Dick, and Rick. The day before the inquest into Craig's death in August, where Janice was exonerated, two bricks wrapped with notes were thrown through her window at her house in Blacktown. Now, Janice hadn't heard from Archie in the five months since he'd come after her with a fence post trying to kill her, but she knew that the bricks and the notes had been thrown by Archie. The first note read, you and your family can go and get fucked because anyone who has anything to do with me is going to die a bad death. You know who this letter is from, so take warning because Bill is the next cab off the rank. Then you go one by one. The note was signed, you know who, and it sure as hell wasn't Voldemort. The Bill that Archie had referred to was Janice's mother's boyfriend, Bill Ryan. The second note read, The only thing in my mind is to kill you, your mother, and Bill Ryan. This is not a bluff, because I'm that dirty on all of you for the death of my son, but I can't let it go at that. I have a matter of a few guns, so I'm going to use them on you all for satisfaction. Beware. The next day, on the 24th of August, 1973, the first day of the inquest into Craig's death, Archie and his gang began their killing spree. Archie was high as a kite on PCP. He had stolen a car, a Volkswagen, and him and his posse started cruising the streets to find a victim. 
It's been said that the rest of the group, mostly teenagers, thought that they were just looking for someone to beat up and rob, but Archie had far more villainous plans for the person that they chose. 50-year-old World War II veteran George Anson would be the first victim. He sold newspapers outside the Canterbury Hotel, and after each shift he would sit at the hotel bar and drink. As the hotel was closing on the 24th, Anson stumbled outside and began to walk home. Walk is probably a bit of a stretch. Anson was so drunk that he was staggering and swaying down the road, and Archie supposed that he would be easy pickings. The group jumped out of the car and dragged Anson into the side street. Anson did not resist. He was too drunk. He hardly knew what was happening. That was until Archie Mad Dog McCafferty grabbed him by the throat. Anson, finally realising what was going on, yelled out to Archie, calling him names, and this was the breaking point for Archie. He started punching and kicking Anson with absolute ferocity in the head, in the ribs, in the stomach, anywhere that he could land a blow. It was at this point that Archie heard the voice for the first time, telling him, kill seven, kill seven, kill seven. George Anson had been on the ground in the gutter trying to stand up when Archie produced a knife and immediately plunged it into Anson's back and neck. A total of, you guessed it, seven times. Before he left, for good measure, Archie kicked George Anson in the face one last time before bolting back to the car. The rest of the group were shocked and almost in awe of Archie and what he'd just done, and the only one who seemed to question him was Rick, asking Archie why he would have done what he did. Archie responded that the man had called him names so he'd stabbed him and then ordered Rick to start driving. Archie made the decision right then and there that he couldn't trust Rick, and that Rick would eventually become one of his seven victims. Archie threw the blood-soaked knife to Julie, who stashed it under the car seat, and not another word was spoken about what had just happened the entire way home. On the drive back to Archie, Carol, and Julie's flat, they stopped in a fast food restaurant, and the group ate burgers while Archie went to the bathroom and washed the blood off him. When he looked up into the restroom mirror, he saw his son calling to him. Archie reached out to his son, but he was gone. He then heard the voice for the second time, telling him, Kill seven, kill seven. When the group arrived back at Archie's apartment, Julie set about cleaning the knife and then gave it back to Archie. He then tried to explain why he had done what he did, why he had killed Anson. He said that he couldn't help himself, he couldn't stop, and he didn't understand why he had done it, except that he heard the voice, Craig's voice, telling him to kill. Now, Archie had frequently visited Craig's grave in the Leppington Cemetery, often with Carol. Carol said that they would go there and Archie would sit at the gravesite and cry, telling his son that it wasn't fair, that he never stood a chance, and that he, Archie, would avenge his son's death. Three days after he'd murdered George Anson, Archie took the group to the cemetery to show them Craig's gravesite. Now, Archie had been using PCP heavily throughout the day, and when they got to the gravesite, Archie heard his son's voice again telling him to kill Seven. They stayed at the site for a little while before they decided to head back to a nearby bar to plan the night's events. They planned it all out. Archie wanted nothing more than to be back at his son's grave, so the gang would drop him off there, and then Julie and Mick would go off hitchhiking. It was raining and cold, and surely someone would feel sorry for the two teenagers out in the rain, take pity on them and pick them up. As soon as a car stopped for them, they would use the guns that they had to force the driver to the cemetery where they'd rob them. Once Archie was back at the gravesite, he completely lost his grip on reality. Because of the fog and the rain and the direction of the streetlights, Archie saw a glow of light around his son's grave. He then saw a figure standing just outside the light. This figure was a man of about 19 or 20 years old, and Archie recognised him immediately. It was his grown-up son, Craig. He approached the figure, who said to him, Dad, is that you, Dad? Archie responded, Is that you, Craig? Yes, Dad, it's me, replied the vision. Archie said, But no, it can't be, you're dead. To which the figure responded, Do you want me to come back to you, Dad? Archie replied that of course he did, but 
how could that happen? The figure said that Archie would have to do something for him. Do this one thing and Craig could come back to him. Didn't he want Craig back? Archie replied, yes, yes, more than anything in the world. I will do anything to have you back. Anything, anything you ask. The vision of Craig then told Archie that he must kill seven people. And as soon as he did, he could have his son back. But he must kill seven. Now, PCP is a drug mainly used for its mind-altering effects. It's commonly known as angel dust, and its effects include hallucinations, distorted perceptions of sound, and violent behaviour. So, it could have been the ghost of a grown-up Craig coming to Archie that night, or it could have been the fact that Archie was completely off his face on a substance known to cause visual and auditory hallucinations. But I'll let you decide. Now, moments after that, a car pulled into the cemetery and stopped just before the gravesite. Julie and Mick had arrived, and with them, at gunpoint, was the gang's second victim, Ronald Cox. Ronald was a coal miner and was on his way home after a hard day's work when he saw two young teenagers on the side of the road hitching a ride in the rain. He immediately felt for the two and he'd stopped to offer them a ride. When he had... Mick pulled a gun on him and made him drive to the cemetery and to Archie. Archie forced Ronald Cox out of the car and made him lie face down in the mud. Archie and Mick both held rifles to the back of Cox's head. Cox was begging for his life, but all Archie could hear was his son's voice urging him to kill seven people and bring him back from the dead. Archie turned to Mick and said that they would have to kill Ronald Cox because he'd seen all their faces. He told Mick to pull the trigger, but Mick hesitated. This gave Cox the time again to plead for his life. He told them he was a father and he needed to get home to his seven children. Seven children. Now, it's a long shot, but if Ronald Cox had had any more or any less children, maybe his life would have been spared. Maybe. But the second he said the number seven, he'd sealed his fate. Both Archie and Mick shot Cox in the back of the head, killing him instantly. As they were leaving, Archie looked back to see the light still shining around his son's grave, and he saw the figure of his son laughing. Archie began to hysterically laugh with him, and he later told the detectives that his one regret in killing Ronald Cox was that he hadn't done it closer to his son's grave so that some of Cox's blood could have spattered on Craig's tombstone. That was his one regret. Archie, Carol, Julie, Mick, Dick and Rick then returned to Archie's apartment. They settled in, they watched some TV, they drank some beer. They all seemed pretty comfortable with what had happened that night. Some of the group would later tell detectives that they thought they were just out to beat up and rob people, but they had seen what Archie had done to George Anson, so Surely they must have known that Cox was going to suffer a similar fate. Only a few hours after arriving back at the unit, the voice began telling Archie that he needed to kill Seven. Archie was only at two, so he instructed Julie, and this time Dick, to go and find him another victim. The two teenagers once again went out hitchhiking, and this time it was 24-year-old Evangelos Colias who took pity on them and stopped to pick them up. Once he'd stopped the car, Dick pulled a twenty-two rifle from under his jacket and forced Coleus into the back seat. They made him lie on the floor of the back, and Julie drove the car back to Archie's apartment. When they got back, Archie took over. He got into the driver's seat, and they headed towards the Sydney suburb of Liverpool. They told Coleus that they needed his car to drive around to find a factory to rob, but Julie and Dick knew that this was a lie. They insisted to Coleus that he would not be harmed, so Coleus lay on the floor of the back seat and he actually went to sleep. Now, personal opinion. If I was held at gunpoint, held hostage in my own car at gunpoint, I don't know if I'd be relaxed enough to fall asleep, but that's what Coleus did. It might have been a defense mechanism or he might have been so exhausted from the pumping of adrenaline that he dozed off in the back. As they were driving, Archie developed the rest of his plan. 
Once they had killed Evangelos Coleus, he was going to drive the car to Blacktown and kill Janice, her mother, and her mother's boyfriend. That would take his body count to six. The seventh victim would be, of course, Donald Rick Webster. Archie didn't trust Rick and had decided well before this night that he would be one of the seven. Then, not only would he have avenged his son's death, but his son would come back to him from the dead. When they had reached the suburb of Marylands, Archie told Dick to shoot Coleus there in the car, and Dick said that he wasn't sure if he could do it. But as they were talking, Coleus started to wake up, and fearing that this would cause a scene, Dick held the sawn-off rifle to Coleus's head and pulled the trigger. Evangelos Coleus died instantly. Before dumping the body in a nearby street, Archie told Dick to shoot the man again. Even though Coleus was already dead, Dick complied and shot him again in the head. Now it was time for Archie to make good on the notes that he'd attached to bricks and thrown through his wife's window. He started to drive towards Blacktown when he realised that the car did not have enough fuel to get there. He would have to postpone these killings, even just for one night. He did not want to get caught driving a blood-stained car into a petrol station and being noticed. The plan would have to wait, but only for a little while. He knew that his wife and his in-laws would be victims four, five, and six, and of course, Rick would be lucky number seven. Rick would probably thank his lucky stars for the rest of his life that the car did not have enough fuel in it that night. It is not known who did it, and no one has ever owned up to it, but one of the other members of the group told Rick that he was on Archie's hit list. Rick knew that Archie wasn't bluffing. He'd been party to three other murders and knew that Archie was planning on four more. Rick made the decision to tell the police what he knew. Rick had worked in the Sydney Morning Herald building, a major newspaper, as an assistant, and the next day at work, he noticed a van parked outside. In it were Archie, Mick and Dick. He knew that they were waiting for him to leave, and their plan was to kill him when he came out of the building. So Rick decided that he'd have one of the reporters call the police, and detectives arrived in minutes. Rick told them everything he knew about the three murders. As soon as he'd finished his story, the detectives called for backup and they quietly sealed off the streets in the area. Heavily armed police surrounded the van and it was Detective Sergeant Aldridge who approached it. He pointed his revolver point blank in the face of Mick Meredith as other officers rushed in to apprehend Archie Mad Dog McCafferty and Dick Whittington. They took possession of the vehicle and two loaded rifles that had been waiting for Rick to exit the building. Now, there was no lengthy investigation needed. On the way back to the police station, Archie, in the back of the cruiser, told police that, yeah, he'd killed the man in Canterbury, and the one in Leppington, and the one in Marylands. He openly confessed to all three murders. He then went on to tell police about his plans for his wife and her family, he said that he was going to drive to Blacktown, and he was just going to start blasting until they were all dead. He said that they were very lucky people that the car did not have enough petrol. He then told detectives that he had planned to cut off his wife's head and mail it in a box to the chief of the Crime Investigation Bureau, very reminiscent of the movie Seven that was released 21 years later. He made no attempt to hide the fact that he still planned on killing four more people. At his committal hearing in February of 1974, Archie pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. All five of his co-conspirators, Carol, Julie, Mick, Dick and Rick, all pleaded not guilty as well to all of the charges. The press was in a frenzy. They had labelled the crimes thrill killings and everyone was eager to get a look behind the curtain of this so-called Australian Charles Manson, who had roped a bunch of impressionable teenagers into hunting down victims and even killing people for him. One of his co-accused had hired a barrister by the name of Bannon, who had been adamant throughout the hearing that without the influence of Archie McCafferty, his client would not have committed or assisted in committing such terrible acts. On the fourth day of the hearing, Archie asked if he could make a statement. 
It was an unusual request, but the judge allowed him to speak. Archie said, quote, Excuse me, your worship, before the court starts, for the last four days I've sat here and listened to Mr. Bannon criticising me on things I've done. Now, I've been wanting to say this for a long time, and I'm going to say it this morning. Mr. Bannon, if you're listening, I'd like to cut your head off. Mr. Bannon was understandably shaken by this announcement to the court, and although he was rattled, he felt safe knowing that Archie was not only handcuffed and guarded, but also heavily drugged. The only way that they could keep Archie calm was to dose him up on tranquilizers, and the normal dose just wasn't cutting it. It was said that every morning Archie would receive a dose of 1500 milligrams of the potent tranquilizer Legactyl, which was almost four times the normal dose of 400 milligrams. It was said that this dose would be enough to knock out a racehorse, but with Archie, it just kept him calm. He was relaxed and jovial during the hearing. He often winked at the court reporters and tried to make jokes. He pretended at times that the bench was a keyboard and mimicked playing the piano. When he got bored, he would etch his name into the wood of the bench, and he was said to have uncontrollable outbursts of rage and violence if he was not kept under heavy medication. Archie was a violent and unruly prisoner. He had attempted to kill another prisoner while in lockup with a bucket in his cell that was used as a toilet, just while awaiting his trial. It was said by prison psychiatrists that Archie's tolerance to the incredible doses of drugs he was being given was evidence in itself that he was insane, or at least being driven insane by the colossal amount of drugs that he had recreationally used and built up a huge tolerance to. At the trial, Archie was examined by three psychiatrists. Dr. William Metcalf gave evidence on behalf of the defence. He said that in his opinion, Archibald McCafferty was insane at the time of the killings because he didn't know that what he was doing was wrong. He was mentally ill, not in tune with reality, and most likely was a paranoid schizophrenic at the time of the killings. Dr. Oscar Schmalzbach was called to give evidence on behalf of the prosecution, and he actually practiced psychiatry at the same clinic as Dr. Metcalf. Now, he offered a completely different opinion. He said that in his view, Archie McCafferty knew at the time that what he was doing was wrong. He went on to say that while he may have had a schizophrenic reaction at the time of the second killing, this did not make him a paranoid schizophrenic. He said that such illnesses do not just exist one day, disappear the next, and then return on the third. The third psychiatrist chose not to give evidence. He surmised that Archie McCafferty was insane, but knew exactly what he was doing at the time of the killings. Now, although the three doctors couldn't agree regarding Archie's sanity, they did all agree on one thing, that Archie was an extreme danger to society and that he should never be set free. Now, Archie decided to take the stand, which is a controversial decision. If you follow the true crime community, you'd know that it's not recommended. Cross-examination can be a bitch. There was no cross-examination needed, though. Now, I'm going to read you Archie's full statement because it is wild, and it's not terribly long, but it is verbatim, so there's going to be some colloquial Australian misspeak. Archie's statement to the court reads as follows. Your Honour and Gentlemen of the Jury, Firstly, I would like to say that at the time of these crimes, I was completely insane. The reason why I done this is for the revenge of my son's death. That is what made me do it. Before this, I had stated to a doctor that I felt like killing people, but up until my son's death, I had not killed anyone. My son's death was the biggest thing that ever happened to me because I loved him so much. He meant the world to me, and after his death, I just seemed to go to the pack. I feel no wrong for what I have done, because at the time that I did it, I did not think it was wrong. But after my son was killed, I tried to kill my wife, and I was admitted into Parramatta Psychiatric Home because I knew I needed treatment. So I signed myself in and was there for a number of weeks. I think, if given the chance, I will kill again. For the simple reason that I have to kill seven people, and I have only killed three 
which means I have four more to go. And this is how I feel in my mind. And I just can't say that I'm not going to kill anyone else because in my mind I am. Whether you think I am sane or insane is up to you, but I would say that I was definitely insane on the night of these murders. The day of my son's inquest in the coroner's court happened to be the day I stabbed Mr. Anson. The reason why I killed this man is because I heard my son's voice tell me to do so. The same with the second and third person. Each time I went to the graveyard to visit my son's grave, a violent streak would come over me and I wanted to be so violent, I wanted to kill people. I kept hearing voices, not only my son's voice, but other voices as well, which I don't know whose they are. On the Thursday that I was apprehended, I had every intentions of killing Rick Webster, as I heard the voices tell me to do so, and anyone else that the voices tell me to kill, I would kill, until I reached the figure seven. I still say I feel no wrong in what I have done, and I am still willing to kill anyone else that I am told to kill. At the time of my son's death, I took it pretty hard, and since then I have not been the same because I loved him so much, and I believe in my own mind that my wife murdered him on purpose, and this is why I killed these men, for the revenge of my son's death. And this is the honest truth, so I hope that the jury and your honour will believe what I said. That's it. That was his statement to court. Like, no cross-examination needed, really. Now, at the conclusion of the trial, Mick Meredith and Dick Whittington were both found guilty of the murders of Ronald Cox and Evangelos Collius, and they were each sentenced to 18 years in prison. Rick Webster, having called the police and confessed, had made a deal with the prosecution and was only found guilty of manslaughter for the death of Ronald Cox. He received a sentence of four years. Julie Todd, who was only 16 at the time of the trial, was found guilty for the murders of Cox and Collius and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Now, only a couple of months later, Julie Todd was found dead in the bathroom of Silverwater Detention Centre. She had hanged herself. She had just turned 17. Carol Howes, however, was found not guilty on all charges, having proven that while she was part of the gang, she did not participate in the finding or killing of any of the victims. She tearfully called out to Archie as she was being led out of the docks. She told him that she would be waiting for him, no matter what, she would wait for him, with their child. As it turned out, Carol was eight months pregnant with Archie's baby. She ended up moving to Blacktown with Archie's mother to have and raise the child. The jury then handed down Archie McCafferty's verdict. Guilty on all counts. He was given three life sentences for his crimes. And even as he was being led out of the courtroom, he yelled that he would kill four more people to avenge the death of his son. Now, Archie Mad Dog McCafferty proved to be an extremely violent and dangerous prisoner. And when he got too much for one prison, they just moved him on to the next one in a process called Shanghaiing. When he was in the Long Bay Jail, he was interviewed by a television crew and he told them that there was nothing that anyone could do to stop him murdering another four people if he was ever released. By 1978, he had been in almost every maximum security prison in the state of New South Wales, and was considered to be one of the worst the penal system in that state had ever seen. At the Grafton Jail in April of 1980, he was caught loosening the bricks in his cell in an attempt to escape. Prison officers had been tipped off and caught him in the act, and he was then just moved on to another jail, this time the Parramatta Jail. It was said that Archie was part of the secret murder squad that existed inside the Parramatta Jail. It was known as that, or the Death Squad, by officers, and by the members of the group, it was called the Star Chamber. And they were responsible for doling out prison justice on people that they decided deserved it. Archie said... If there was a stabbing, or an iron barring, or a talking to, or a murder, or a drug deal needing done in the prison, we would sanction it. Police believe the group of dangerous criminals were responsible for the murder of at least four people within the prison over 1981. In September of 1981, Archie was charged with one of these murders. Edward James Lloyd had been stabbed to death in his cell. 
Archie was accused along with Kevin Michael Gallagher, and eventually it was Gallagher who was found guilty of the murder. It was proved, however, that Archie was present at the time, and so he was found guilty of manslaughter, and an additional 14 years was added to his three life sentences. Archie adamantly denied any involvement, and you would think someone who had claimed that many times that he was going to murder another four people would own up to it if he did it. But to prove his innocence, he decided to name every member of the Star Chamber responsible for the murders in the prison, which was a huge mistake. He now had a massive target on his back, and he probably should have been the first person to know that snitches get stitches. Archie McCafferty instantly became a wanted man, and this created a massive headache for the jail. For his own protection, he was transferred from one jail to another, but not after being caught with ten foil-wrapped packages of heroin and being handed down another three years on top of his mounting prison time. For the next few years, he was transferred between Maitland, Long Bay, and Parkley prisons, and he continued to be an informant to authorities, particularly focused on the serious criminal misconduct of the prison officers themselves. Now, because of this, he was eventually moved into the Long Bay Prison Special Protection Unit. This was a unit that was normally reserved for prisoners who'd committed crimes against children, as they were the most likely to be beaten and killed by other prisoners and officers. Archie did find ways to pass the time, mainly by sniffing solvents and petrol fumes, and by the recurring delusions concerning his dead son. It was said that these were also spurred on by heavy depression at no prospect of any future release. Archie continually applied for parole while he was in this unit, as no parole period had ever been set, and Archie was worried that he'd spend the rest of his life behind bars. In October of 1991, one of his numerous applications for parole was granted, he was given a parole period of 20 years, and this was backdated to before he'd even been caught for his crimes. He was given the period from the 30th of August 1973, making him eligible for parole in less than two years, on the 29th of August 1993. Now this news seemed to change Archie. He began to display exemplary behaviour, his anger subsided, and eventually he was considered safe enough to be transferred to the Berrimah Minimum Security Prison in Sydney South. He applied for parole every year, and each year it had been denied. But still, he continued to keep his anger in check, and his behaviour. He was eventually allowed weekend furlough to stay with his brother, his brother's wife and their children, from Friday until Sunday every week without supervision. He'd even been married and divorced while in prison to a woman named Mandy Queen. Now it got to the point where he was on work release, being allowed to leave the prison and got to go to work six days a week. Eventually, the parole board agreed that he was a changed man, that he was no longer a danger to the community and should be released on parole. What the parole officers had discovered, though, is that Archie's parents, whilst moving the family to Australia almost 40 years beforehand, they had never applied for or received Australian citizenship. Therefore, one of the conditions of Archie's release is that he would be deported back to Scotland. The Scottish authorities absolutely did not want Archibald McCafferty back in their country, and Archie pleaded to not have to go, but it was no use. On the 1st of May 1997, Archie was released and put straight on a plane to go back to his home country. When Mandy Queen heard this news, she immediately jumped on a plane to reunite with her prison husband or ex-husband. She left behind her three and five-year-old daughters for a convicted serial killer. She said that she did it to help him, that he had taught her a lot about right and wrong. Not sure how that's possible, but okay. They moved to Edinburgh after being threatened by the residents of his hometown that there would be hell to pay if he moved back to Glasgow. Archie and Mandy had their first child together, a son named Conal, in 1998. In October of 1998, Archie McCafferty allegedly got into an argument with Mandy after a drinking binge, and she claimed that he'd taken off with their four-month-old baby. 
A police car chase ensued, and he threatened to kill two of the police officers. Upon his capture, as well as the death threats, he pleaded guilty to careless driving, driving with no license or insurance, failing to provide a breath specimen, and breach of the peace. He was sentenced to two years probation. Later that same year, Archie McCafferty and Mandy Queen actually got remarried in a small private ceremony, and they eventually settled in England. They rented a small commission home in Southsea and went on to have another child, a girl named Chloe. In June 2002, police were called to the home for a domestic dispute and Archie attacked one of the constables with a knife. He was charged with assault and was expected to face court on the 17th of November of that year. But he never turned up to his court date. He had fled Britain with his wife and children and had attempted to move to New Zealand, Authorities think that he was trying to secretly sneak back into Australia. When he didn't turn up in court, a warrant was issued for his arrest and the New Zealand authorities were tipped off and he was immediately kicked out of the country. He returned to the UK and spent time hiding out in Northern Ireland. And then he moved back to Scotland with Mandy and the kids to a town called Harwick. Now he lived there for two months before he was tracked down in 2003 and he was fined £50 and given two months community service. Again, he escaped any prison time. In April 2004, he had a fight with Mandy, and he slashed her with a knife. She had fled with their baby girl, but Archie Mad Dog McCafferty holed himself up in their flat in Harwick with a knife to the throat of their five-year-old son. A tense standoff followed, and at last, after about an hour and a half, Archie surrendered the child to police officers. It took about another 30 minutes for Archie to give himself up. He pled not guilty to assault, attempted murder, and abduction, and because his prior murders had been committed outside of Britain, they would not form part of his sentencing considerations. He only received six months jail time. Not surprisingly, Mandy and Archie's marriage dissolved and Mandy moved back to Australia to try and reunite with her daughters, who don't seem to want much to do with her. Archie began seeing a woman named Shirlene Love after they met in 2008. In November of 2008, he was pulled over driving another stolen car. He had been living under the name of James Locke to try to escape media attention, but his identity was revealed when police pulled him over driving a Volvo that had been reported stolen. He was sentenced to 200 hours community service. When asked about the incident a year later in 2009, he reacted angrily, claiming that the constant media attention he received when he was deported back to Scotland had made his life difficult and he just wanted to be left alone. He said, there are guys going around molesting children and you're doing a story on a guy doing nothing? I'm not a criminal. I fucked up, but it was a year ago. It was a bloody car and not a mass murder. I think what he meant there was, it was a bloody car and not another mass murder. He went on to say, I'm not public property. I'm just a normal guy trying to get on with my life. Why don't you give me a break? My crimes were 35 years ago. In August of 2012, he was seen working at his partner's dress shop in Edinburgh. He continues to lash out at reporters whenever they try to get a picture or a story. He still lives in Scotland with his partner, Shirlene, and he's also had numerous unsuccessful attempts to publish his life story and autobiography, which he called Shall Seven Die, which he wrote while he was in prison. I can't find record of it ever being released or published, and believe me, I tried. He doesn't seem to have committed any other crimes in the 17 years since his standoff with police. Maybe he has finally curbed his aggression and violence? But I would wonder how often he thinks about the four more murders he needs to commit to bring back his first child. Well guys, that's it. That is the story of Archie Mad Dog McCafferty and the Kill 7 murders. Again, tell me what you think about the Manson comparison in the comments. I mean, I see a few of the similarities, but I still think that Manson is on a completely different level to Archibald McCafferty. Now, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully I will see you on the next one. But until then, be good, make good choices, and don't murder anyone. Bye.